The Philippines rainforest is the source of life for the many cultures of indigenous people. It is also the source of profits for the big logging companies, which for the people who live in the forest means expulsion or extinction. The indigenous people are, however, not defenseless. They resort to the gun to stop the destruction of their environment. In 1986, I lived for eight months with the guerrillas of the New People's Army, NPA. At that time, protection of the environment and support for indigenous cultures was not a high priority for the communist-led movement. I was pleasantly surprised to hear that in the meantime this has changed. I have returned after eight years to see for myself the red fighters who are becoming known as the green guerrillas. I am staying four weeks with the NPA as a guest of the Mandayans, the tribal people of southeast Mindanao. Fulfilled by the beauty of the landscape, but exhausted by a full day's tramp, we stopped to catch our evening meal. Here we also meet Kapa King, a regional party leader. His party is the product of a long history of social injustice in the country. Ten years ago, against the hated Marcos dictatorship, the revolutionary struggle became one of the most successful in the world. Since then, the movement has lost steam, although the living conditions of the majority of the people have significantly worsened. A new orientation was necessary. Paking tells me I have arrived just in time to film the last days of tree felling in the area. The guerrillas have declared a ban on all commercial logging here in Mindanao the country's second largest island. Paking is reassured by the truck driver that this is his last load of logs. The company for which he works has decided to vacate the hills early to avoid being entangled in a war. It is the calm before the storm. I feel a tension building, although the MPA holds itself back. Only small acts of sabotage take place against loggers who violate previous agreements. These chainsaws were confiscated by an armed unit of Mandayans who stumbled upon a gang of timber workers in an important watershed area. Datu Asenio, the chief, explained that although this was no major act, it was a severe warning for those who know the militancy of the tribe. Paking leads me to a village where I'm officially welcomed into a Mandayan community by a balyan, or medicine man. He calls on his ancestors to protect me and our crew for our work in the mountains. Four million, about 5% of Filipinos, are indigenous people. 400,000 of these are Mandayan. They tell me about life in their ancestral domain. Once hunters and gatherers, they now mainly rely on simple farming as a means of subsistence, using a wide variety of native plants. Local clans live and work closely together, the basis for strong tribal structures. This is something the NPA learned the hard way in 1987 when more than 200 of their fully armed red fighters were ejected from the mountains by angry Mandayan warriors. 
Paking regretfully explained that the comrades had repeatedly failed to abide by traditional laws and had tried to introduce, forcibly in some cases, a foreign or lowland sense of justice and democracy. That has now changed, as Paking is keen to show me. The Mandayans welcome back the reformed revolutionary forces as an integral part of their communal life. During this engagement ceremony, Pa King, although a lowlander, is honoured by the invitation to be a witness, along with the Datus, or chiefs. After the feast, Pa King is asked to mediate in a dispute between the fathers of the couple. The young woman's father does not believe the other has enough money to pay the required dowry. Pa King is able to guarantee payment because he knows of the man's participation in a rice farm project set up by the NPA. Later, a woman appeals to Paking for help for her husband, who has burst an eardrum. Paking is tired. Relatively minor concerns, such as this, consume a large amount of his time and energy. But in his experience, it is only the patient solving of these urgent daily problems which enables him to keep clearly in perspective the larger aims of the revolution. The main drive of the revolutionary forces now is to declare a lag ban. Without a lag ban, we can never protect the environment. We can never protect the indigenous people. And we cannot build revolutionary bases. Before the Europeans arrived, in the 16th century, the archipelago was completely covered in trees. Some of these people remember that a few decades ago, only half of the trees remained standing. At the end of the Marcos dictatorship in 1986, forest cover was down to only 20%. Since then, deforestation has accelerated. The indigenous people have been bombed and bulldozed from their ancestral domains at the same rate. In the last eight years since Marcos, there has been an increase of more than two million internal refugees. Many reach for the gun. very sure that after the declaration of log ban and the forcible ejectment of the logging operators in the forests, there will be massive retaliation. But we have prepared much for this. Basically our preparation involves the indigenous people and the setting up of the revolutionary base. We are not deviating even an inch from that direction. A very broad revolutionary base supported by the indigenous people cannot be simply bombarded continually by the uh, military of the reactionary forces. Because a 100 square kilometer area will need all the bombs that the AFP can muster throughout its budget for a single year.
Mandayan's biggest fear is the Ramos regime's fast-track economic growth strategy, called Philippines 2000. One of its stated aims is to end tribal autonomy for the benefit of the nation. The big logging companies have been given the green light to continue cutting down primal forest. In its place, monocrops are planted, such as the fast-growing exotic tree, Gemellina. Beautiful lowland landscapes of fish ponds and rice fields are no replacement for the well-balanced ecosystem of the rainforest. For the comrades of the New People's Army, it has become a race against time to take the initiative and institute reforestation themselves. And this with as many varieties of native species as possible. While here their replanting program has only just begun, in other regions it has already reached large-scale proportions. Not all Mandayans are happy to be involved with the NPA.
unya kita matingun ay dala mangkai para kita lang maka baba maka mangkali kita na untra pero pagun sa mang kita kung wa dai na tita kain pa kita dagan mangi na buwi sato tumagta The deadline for the loggers draws near. Their camps fall strangely silent. But they have not yet given up. One of the larger companies, which until now has been paying taxes to the NPA, tries to bribe the guerrillas by letter. I ask Pa King what his attitude now is to the so-called revolutionary taxes. Well, before, it's a, it's, it's a common knowledge. Even the enemy knows it, that uh, we had been taxing these logging companies for a very long time now. When we were accepting these taxes, as we accept these taxes, it's also equivalent to condoning the loggers to wreak havoc on the indigenous people. We, we cannot do something to stop this because we are being paid. They, they, the loggers are, are paying taxes. So after summing up these experiences, we have decided we must stop now. How prepared are the guerrillas for a major showdown? I have some doubts. For Paking and the other party leaders, the answer is easy. The revolutionary forces and the people are one, and as long as the guerrilla tactics are properly developed, they will succeed. But as they admit, it is not so easy to combine revolutionary ideas with traditional ideas of indigenous culture. Why, for example, did the Mandayans attack the comrades in 1987? One of the leading Kadas, Ka Ato, himself a Mandayan, explains. Medyo bisan mga ginagmay nga mga uh, kasaypanan sa mga tao, himuunan dako nga para mahimong mga salbid sa baka sa mga kauban. Uh, mismo sa akong asahid, medyo gibati po kwantong ka, uh, uh, kahiubos sa mga kauban. Noto nga, wala gihapong ko magpahikot, paday yung gihapong ko. Uh, hantod ka nga nagpabilin pa ko sa revolusyonaryong kalihukan. Huwag sa relasyon tali sa uh, revolusyonaryong kalihukan nga ito sa mga nitibo, mandaya, medyo takaon nagkausaban kung itandi na ito sa unang mga panahon. Umikan sa mga pagtahod sa mga kauban. Ang pagtahod po sa kultura na naandan sa mga mandaya, kuan po. Uh, dako ka yung kuan sa mga tao na uh, maayo ang relasyon sa mandaya tali po sa mga tao ilabi na po sa pagkakaroon nga panahon nga halos-halos din sa uh, kamandayahan na po yung mga mandaya po halos-halos mga mandaya po ang mga tao na nakakaroon din hindi kita Buti pa sabot nga ang mga kauban uh, nagasunod yun sa kinaiya o balaod sa mga mandaya. The underground school was one of the things I was most keen to see. I had already heard from other tribal areas just how important an alternative education system is. It is a crucial part of the movement's plans to build local government on a grassroots level, construction of their own unique form of socialism. The underground school is a revelation. 
we are discovering that uh, we can use it to study the Mandayan culture and trace back our history, our culture before, and find out where did we start to go wrong. The UG school is uh, simply devastating. The Mandayan culture, as studied through the underground school, is like a homecoming for us. We feel that we are being assimilated by the Mandayan culture. We have our own culture, we have our own Filipino identity. But it was lost during the colonialists and capitalists uh, onslaught. And these indigenous people, the, particularly in this area, the Mandayan people, have preserved this and thereby giving us a priceless tool for correcting our damaged culture. Self-sufficient health care is also necessary. The Western methods administered by the comrades can only be of partial assistance. Lampunayon, Balyan, or medicine woman, teaches Ka Aileen, a medic from the lowlands, herbal cures, or other means of traditional healing. Meanwhile, some of the more belligerent loggers step up their activities and work around the clock to extract as much timber as possible from the forest before the log ban officially comes into force. Shield against the coming wrath of the military, the community invites representatives of the MPA to share in a call for protection from the ancestors. During the ceremony, I become aware of just how powerful the women are in Mandayan culture. Lampunayan takes responsibility for the community and becomes a medium for the spirits. She personifies the link to the past, without which, the Mandayans believe, there can be no future. Like many other indigenous peoples in the world, they believe that without the blessing of the ancestors, all the best laid plans of present generations would be pointless, if not disastrous. Oh, 
Although the comrades from the lowlands do not yet fully grasp the depths of the Mandayan culture, they are prepared to accept it. They believe their survival too depends on it. The indigenous people in the Philippines has a very simple dream. They just wanted to return back to the lowlands where once upon a time their ancestors were toiling the lands. Of course, uh, in another sense, they wanted to impart their concept of ownership. The concept that nobody owns the land, but rather the land owns the people. Every day that dream is being constructed by the unity of the indigenous people and the revolutionary forces. Every day we are going nearer that dream. And it adds a new perspective, a new dimension to what a real and genuine revolution is. While we were visiting the next village, an enemy patrol marched provocatively into the mountains. The guerrillas let them pass without incident. But the underground school had to be partially dismantled and later reassembled in order to allay suspicion. Everyday life in a guerrilla war.